If you have your Bibles, you can go back to Acts 3. We're going to finish that up this morning. <clears throat> don't want to leave you hanging so that you don't know what happened. <laughs> While you're turning there, I'll answer a question here. We were in Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> it said, please contrast between Mark 16, where healing is imparted to all who believe, and 1 Corinthians 12, where the gift of the Spirit of healing gift of the Spirit of healing is only given to some. All right, that's good. <clears throat> there is a difference. There is what you're doing as a believer in laying hands on the sick is <clears throat> it says if you lay hands on the sick, meaning unbelievers, then generally, well, what it says is they will recover. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about gifts, plural, of healings, plural. Both are plural. Uh, Dr. Summerall, who was probably the foremost teacher of the gifts of the Spirit, uh, I had the privilege of sitting under him for several years and learning from him directly, and he had learned about the gifts directly from Howard Carter, who was the person responsible for actually reintroducing the gifts into the church in the early 1900s uh, and explaining the, the operations of them. And so, <clears throat> I guess you could say I kind of got it from the horse's mouth, right? So... Um, it was good because I was able to ask questions and things. And Dr. Summerall used to say that when it says gifts, plural, of healings, plural, he said it might be that there are as many gifts as there are people's need of individual healing. In other words, if you needed $5 and I gave you $5, that would be a gift of $5 for your immediate need of $5. Now, that doesn't mean you would always have $5. It means at that moment, I give you $5 for that right then immediate need and he said that that would be so when you say gifts of healing well let me, let me say that accurately most times in the church <clears throat> it is referred to as a gift of healing okay it's not a gift of healing it's gifts of healings now you can have a gift of healings and if several people in the room had a gift of healing then it would be gifts of healings right but each individual person that has a gift of healings would have many healings operating in their life. <clears throat> now the difference between gifts and the ministry of a believer, number one, 1 Corinthians 12 is talking more about uh, what takes place in a church rather than what takes place in public or in evangelistic type ministry. Now <clears throat> gifts, the way that generally the easiest way to spot a gift it's one of those things that where Jesus said, remember when he was referring to the, the Spirit, he said, you don't know where the Spirit comes from or where it goes, but you can see the results of it. You, you can, it's like the wind blowing. You, you can't see the wind, but you can see the trees moving. And so with gifts of the Spirit, since they are gifts of the Spirit, you can't always tell ahead of time how they operate. It's by looking over a period of time and seeing a pattern that you could say, oh, well, that's what that is. So... For instance, I really don't claim to operate by a gift of the Spirit. Now, however, I do know that gifts operate. But especially in teaching, I'm not teaching you based on gifts because then, as it says, he divides severally as he will and it says you to covet them and things like that. But it's not something that each individual person is guaranteed. So I try to get back to the, to the essentials and to the bare minimum of things that you can count on every time. All right? That's Mark 16. <clears throat> now, you get into a situation, and as you start ministering to people, you will notice <clears throat> that in two places, really the, the only place where gifts are, <clears throat> excuse me, to any degree defined is in 1 Corinthians 12. And we're going to talk about that, matter of fact, today. Not gifts, but where they're at. And the only other place that they're even slightly mentioned is in Romans chapter 12. And in Romans, it actually gives you a, little few, a few little details that 1 Corinthians doesn't give you about operating in them. It says, if any man prophesy, let him prophesy according to his proportion of faith. Now, prophesying is one of the gifts of the Spirit. So it shows that gifts of the Spirit are operated by faith, just like anything else. And so if you're going to operate in a gift... You're going to have to step out in faith and operate in that gift by faith. And as your proportion, listen carefully, we've all been given the measure of faith. Okay? 
just like we've all been given the exact same number of muscles. Okay? But your proportion of faith is not up to God. It's up to you exercising it and increasing it. Okay? Now, what that means is that it's, we may all have the same number of muscles, but some people use them more than others. And so the muscles are going to be more developed in the people that use them than in those that don't. So it's the same thing. We're, we've all been given the measure of faith. We all start out at the same place. But then by exercising our faith, we can get it to grow stronger in areas. And <clears throat> again, going back to what we were talking about yesterday, as far as we're not talking about uh, measure or, or volume. Okay, We're talking about quality in the sense of it being consistent and persistent. Okay? Now, for instance, Richard Roberts, years back, uh, started operating in the gift of the word of knowledge. When he started, he'd be on television and he'd say, there's somebody out there with back problems. Okay, well, that's a pretty safe guess, all right? It didn't take a strong activation of the gift to operate that way, Okay? And when I had a chance to meet with him and, and talk with him some, and we discussed some things about gifts, one of the things that I emphasized was that if you won't get, how can I say, um, comfortable, if you'll keep stretching, and whatever comes to your mind when you're operating in that journal, the more specific you will get, you are increasing your proportion of faith in that area, and as you do that, your gift will get stronger and God will give you more details and it will get more specific. And so, like William Branham. William Branham, when he started, he wasn't quite as specific. He developed. Now, he was always specific, just not as much. But as he got more confident in it, did it more, saw the results, got more faith in it, stepped out more, it operated more. And so, it's that way with all the gifts. Now, the way you know you have a gift sometimes, one of the ways, especially in the gifts of healing, because there may be a gift of healing, singular, for epilepsy. There may be a gift of healing for tuberculosis. There may, you see what I'm saying? There may be specific gifts for specific diseases. And the way that you can tell that is that when you start ministering to a lot of people, as certain people come to you with that particular illness, or sometimes even several illnesses, you, you can watch. As a matter of fact, I've done this on video. I go back and I'll watch the healing services. And people will come up and say, I've got this disease. And I'm like, okay, let's pray. We'll go after it. Pray normal. You know, when I say pray, what I mean is minister. Because we're not asking God to heal. We're ministering healing. And so, and then I would come along and somebody else would say something else. And if it is something I have seen beaten just every time. I mean, just, you know, easy. It's kind of like they'll say, well, I've got this. I'm like, oh, okay, here, watch this. See, the difference is, oh, you got that? Okay, let's deal with it. Then, if it's something that you have dealt with and beat consistently, when they mention it to you, it's like, oh, yeah, sure, let's do it. See, it's a, there's a difference. And usually, that's when the gift kicks in, right? But you step out in faith, and you, you'll notice that over a period of time. It's like, you know what, I, I prayed for 100 people. Uh, six of them had epilepsy, Right? Now, several other people got healed too, but everybody with epilepsy got healed. Okay, that's probably a gift for epilepsy, right? Now, I said all that to get back to this. All that doesn't matter. What matters is you have whatever you need to minister to any person standing in front of you, right? So we don't focus on gifts. <clears throat> and it, See, y'all keep doing this. You keep just pulling, okay? Um... Remember this toward the end, okay? Because this is where it usually comes in. In Jesus' ministry, you don't see any mention or reliance upon gifts at all. He doesn't mention gifts. He doesn't mention anything. Uh, as, as close as he comes to it, basically, as he says, you know, it's not me that does work, but the, my, my Father and the Spirit of my Father in me, he does it, you know? And... He tells the disciples, you know, this spirit, and he talks about the spirit of truth and all that. Well, he doesn't really mention gifts. And today we're going to see, as a matter of fact, in Romans, Paul barely mentioned gifts. I mean, hardly at all. 
he gave a longer list in 1 Corinthians 12. And the main reason being is who he was talking to and the circumstances. So we're going to see that today. So I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but I, I want you to understand that as you grow up in Christ, your focus on gifts will diminish. Okay? Now, <clears throat> you will, again, talking about the backwards church, what we do in the church is we think that if I get spiritual enough, God may use me in a gift of the Spirit. And again, try not to get too far ahead of myself or let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, before we get there. The mention of the gifts in 1 Corinthians, Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, you are carnal, you're not spiritual, I can't speak to you like spiritual people, and I can't give you anything deep. Right? Then, nine chapters later, he details the gifts of the Spirit. Which means, and, and he even told the Corinthians, you are carnally minded, you, you got sin in your congregation that even the heathen don't do. Right? So whenever the church is sinning better than the heathen, there is a problem. Right? And then he goes on and says, oh, but as far as gifts go, you got, you got the gifts operating and you don't come behind anybody when it comes to gifts. Right? So that completely disproves the idea of getting spiritual enough to operate in gifts, right? Let me, let me say it this way. Gifts, and, and actually Smith Wigglesworth believed exactly the same way. Gifts are like your spare tire, right? You only need it kind of when you wish you didn't need it, right? Gifts are for any lack that you have. When someone stands in front of you and you lack something, and I'm very careful about using that because so, I'm going to say something later that's going to sound like just the opposite. But I want you to understand that whenever you're not where you ought to be, God still loves those people in front of you. And He still wants them healed and set free and you know, blessed regardless of your spiritual development. And so in that time... If you're open for His Spirit to operate a gift through you, His Spirit will come in and do what you should be able to do without it. Right? But it's a lacking on your part that makes the Spirit have to come in and fill in what you can't do on your own. And I hate to even use those words because I know what you're thinking. All right? <clears throat> but what it means is, Smith Wigglesworth used to say, I stretch my faith out there as far as it'll go. Knowing that if my faith won't get it done, God has nine gifts of the Spirit He can tack onto the end of my faith to get it there. Okay? So, gifts doesn't mean that you just sit back and go, okay, God, do your thing. There is your part to do. You stretch. You stretch in faith. You step out in faith. You do what you need to do. And if there is some reason, stupidity, uh, you, know, some, you know, you knew better, but you did something stupid... Uh, or a lack of preparation in the sense that, well, you didn't study, you didn't do this. You know, anything, any area that would cause you not to have the peace that that person needs, the Spirit is there to make up for that lack. All right? That's a gift. And the funny thing is, that's what all Christians want to head toward. You know? <clears throat> it's like, are, are you really looking forward to using the spare tire? No, because it means you had a flat. Right? That's the way gifts are operating. So, the best thing is to grow up in Christ, be a full-grown, as we would say, son of God, operate like the son of God, and be able to meet the need of any person that stands in front of you at any time, and be able to get them 100% 100 of the people healed 100% of the time. Right? That, that's what sons are supposed to do. And so that's where we're headed. Amen? All right, now, so did that help with gifts? I mean, did, can I answer the question? We're good? Okay. We'll get into it a little bit further on. In Acts chapter 3, yesterday we read, obviously, Peter and John going up to the temple means they hadn't prayed yet. They weren't prayed up. They weren't, you know, what we would say ready. And then they met the lame man that was not looking for healing. He was looking for money. We went through all the mistakes Peter made in telling them, look on us and what I got I'm going to give you. 
And then we notice, and, and this is something else to remember. It said that he commanded him, such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That's verse 6. Then in verse 7 it says, and he took him by the right hand. Now, when it comes to laying hands on people, there are all kinds of ways to do it. The typical way and the way that most people think of is get in a line and put your hand on their head and, you know, that's laying hands. There, there's nothing really in the New Testament that talks about laying hands on somebody's head. Okay? Matter of fact, we get that from the Old Testament of when they, it, it was an, uh, during the process of anointing and a process of ordination, basically what we would call ordination. Every time it mentions in the New Testament about someone laying hands, it either doesn't tell where they laid the hand, or it says they took them by the hand, or it says they took them by the right hand. Every time. All right? So when people say, well, how do you lay hands? Okay, well, it's not, you know, how is not the big deal. It is the fact that you're making contact. Now, I will tell you this. If you take a person by the hand, and, and I will demonstrate that to you even tomorrow tomorrow evening. When you take them by the hand, even if it is, you take them by the, by the right hand, and even if it's their left foot that's hurting, the power of God will travel from their right hand to the left foot. Alright? You don't have to put your hand on their left foot. Okay? Remember that. That's going to come in handy whenever you're dealing with people that have breast cancer. Okay? That means you don't have to put your hand on their breast. All right. Matter of fact, please don't. Okay. Ask me why I'm telling you this, because <laughs> I've had to deal with it. All right. I've had people we've trained. They write back and say, "This is what happened," and I'm like, "Oh Lord, please, <laughs> don't let them mention the name of the ministry." <laughs> you know, <clears throat> because people do things that are unwise. Okay. So just realize that God's power can can flow through. You don't have to put your hand on the afflicted part. You can put it on their shoulder. You can. I, I almost always, if you've been watching how I've been praying for people, almost always I take people by the hands. Almost every time. There's several reasons for that. Uh, it's more by uh, experience than direct revelation, I guess I would say. Um, <clears throat> whenever... When I take people by the hand, and, and I would also tell you, when you pray, the Bible says watch and pray, so it's okay to keep your eyes open. Amen. Okay? You don't have to close your eyes. Matter of fact, I would suggest you don't. Right? Unless you're holding both their hands. Right? Because if you're not holding their hands and you start praying for them and you close your eyes and they have a devil, you're probably going to get hit. Okay? But if you hold their hands, you can kind of tell if they start to punch at you. You know what I'm saying? So, then you can close your eyes, but I still don't suggest it. I, I still have a habit sometimes of closing my eyes. I try to break it, but I, I'm not real concerned about getting hit. So, you know, but if I don't hold their hands, then yeah, I'll either step back far enough where they got to step toward me, or I will keep my eyes open. All right. Um, there's also ways to hold people's hands that you want to be able to let go. Again, I'll show you all this tomorrow night during the healing service how to do this because there are, there are reasons. Um, all these these little nuggets I give you, okay, they all came by an experience somewhere, okay? I, I got stories, okay? Um, had a boy up in, oh yeah, in Canada that tried to, well, actually he had a, basically had tried to commit suicide, and we, we started breaking that spirit off of him, and the first thing he wanted to do was, well, his first, it was like someone attached electrical cords to him, because he just he looked just beat. I mean, he was he just come off the street, had been living on the street, and we had him fill out a card at that time about what they needed prayer for. Because that's a lot faster, okay? Because if I say tell me what the problem is, you'll give me your medical history, and we'll stand there for 25 minutes, right? And honestly, I'm not a doctor. I don't need your medical history. All, all I need is a name or a symptom. If you got that, if you don't, we don't even need that really. It just gives me something to focus on. And so I had this guy's card, and I'm looking at it, and had all this stuff on there, and he said, you know, I tried to commit suicide. I'm like, okay, well, we better deal with that suicide spirit thing first. And so I said, all right. And he just kind of stand like this. And I said, spirit of suicide, I, I come against you right now, and I command you, I break your power. And all of a sudden, I'm just standing there. And he's like this, and he goes, I mean, just like someone had just, you know, put some electrodes on him. And he just jerked forward. And I'm standing there, and I'm holding the card. And when he did it, I'm, I'm like, you know, <laughs> okay, okay. 
And I, I'm thinking, you know, I can pray for you conscious or unconscious. I don't care. Okay? <laughs> okay. It ain't doesn't matter to me either way. But um, and it, it was it was about a 45 minute situation. I, I dealt with him and prayed for other people and come back because eventually he dropped down on the ground and was crawling like a snake and had a sweatshirt on and real baggy pants and crawling across the floor. He crawled out of his pants and this is in a church. <laughs> It's in a church service, so it was different. He started, you know, actually saying, well, he started saying some pretty strong profanity out loud. Would you shut your mouth? And he'd stop and be about three or four minutes or a woman would walk past him or something. He'd just start, he, he it was really strange because he was married, but the spirit in him hated women. He had something very strong against women. And he was, you know, all these profanities, right? told you to shut your mouth. And he'd shut up again for about two or three minutes. And then it would start up again. So finally one of the elders there went and got some anointing oil and was putting it on his head. And the guy, he started profanity again. So this guy just took the anointing oil and poured it in his mouth. And that shut him up for a bit, you know. So <laughs> he had olive oil going out of his mouth. So. But um, I have to say, I, I've never been in another service exactly like that one. So. But, but when we finished, he was free. And the next morning, he was one of the first ones in the church. And when he came in, I, I, literally, I did not recognize him. I mean, his, his entire physical appearance was totally different. And when he, he I mean, I'd seen him, you know, 12, 12 hours before. And when he came in, <clears throat> he and his wife came in, and I, I barely recognized her. And so he ran over and grabbed me and shook my hand and, you know, started thanking me and everything. And I'm like, you know, what for? And he goes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy from last night. And I'm like, Really? I mean, that's, it was, and then the wife came up and she was just crying and hugged me and just, you know, thank you so much. I got my husband back and, you know, I've been through hell is what she was going. She was, you know, and she had been. I heard later some of the stuff that had gone on, but it was tremendous. But, um, you know, I, I've learned since then. Another lady one time, I was praying for her and was holding her hands. And this is before I knew how to hold people's hands correctly. And power of God hit her and she went down and she grabbed my hands and I went down with her and you know I'm trying to get loose and right when she hit the floor she turned loose so I was able to I, I landed over her in a push up position right and I'm thinking okay I need some help here somebody's going to have to lift because I couldn't move because I, I would be touching her and so the guys had to come up and grab me by the arms and lift me straight up and I'm thinking okay there has to be a better way than that okay and I, I was sure you know National Enquirer somebody was going to come out with a camera and you know, another preacher falls, you know, literally, you know, so, so I, so I thought, okay, so then just looking at some things, I, I developed a way to hold people's hands that if they start to fall, you can get away, you know, get away from them, and um, I, I, I call it the quick release, and that way you can just get out quicker, and they fall, and you stand, so anyway, I'll show you that tomorrow night, <clears throat> see, you won't find this in a book, all right, this is by experience, okay, but, now, Acts chapter 3, was still there. He lifted him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And you notice he didn't get healed until he lifted him. So Peter, even though Peter gave the command, the man didn't do anything, Peter had to do something, right? Now, generally, this is classified as a working of miracles. One of the gifts of the Spirit is, is the, working, the gift of the working of miracles. It's not a gift of miracles, Really, there is no gift of miracles. There's the gift of the working of miracles. The working of miracles means you have to do something to work it, right? When you don't have to do anything for a miracle to happen, and what most people call the gift of miracles is actually the gift of faith. And that's when you just, basically it's like Moses, stand still and see the salvation of God. In other words, here we're just going to stand here and watch what God does, all right? That's what most people want. Because then if God don't do anything, they don't look stupid, Right? But the working of miracles mean you do something, and then if it don't work after you do it, then you look stupid, right? So that's why you hardly ever see the working of miracles in church, because nobody wants to take a chance to look stupid, right? So you have to do something to work the miracle. That's the gift of working of miracles, all right? Anyway, okay. <clears throat> Next it says, and he, and he, leaping, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, Walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he. 
which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them into the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, saw the people running to him, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Now, here's the thing to remember. You cannot argue with a man that does it. Right? Simple as that. You just, if, it, if he's doing it consistently and it works, you can't argue. And especially when it comes to Bible, if somebody in the Bible says, this is how I did it, you can't argue with that. Right? You can't go, well, now this is what really took place. No, he knew and God put it in there and if he said, this is how I did it, then that's how he did it. Amen? Now, I told you from the beginning, I believe the Bible literally. Right? Matter of fact, very literally. Okay? I'll show you how literally here in a few minutes. <clears throat> and he says, When Peter saw it, he answered and said unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why, now listen to this, or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Now, first off, this one verse destroys about 90% of all healing teaching. Right? Because first off, he says, notice this. Why do you look on us as though by our own power or holiness? In other words, it wasn't an anointing. It wasn't because we're apostles. It wasn't because we had special authority. It wasn't any of that kind of stuff. He said, and notice the second part, our holiness. In other words, this was before they prayed. They hadn't even prayed yet. Okay? So it wasn't by their holy life. It wasn't by their praying and fasting and doing everything just right. In other words, we hadn't done anything right. And we didn't do... It wasn't by our power because we're apostles or because we're special or highly anointed or especially anointed that we did this. Now watch. He says... And then he takes the chance to, to preach a little bit. He says, The God of Abraham... And of Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up. So he takes, a chance, he takes an opportunity here to point the finger and put the blame on them for killing Jesus. And you denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Now see all that you know, controversy over um, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, over, well, was it the Jews that killed Jesus? Was it the Romans that killed him? Okay, Peter just answered it right there. The Romans were ready to give him up and say it's okay, and the Jews said, no, you kill him. So it was the Jews' fault, according to this. Right? Now, technically, though, it was our sin. Right? So technically, we all killed him. Okay? Real simple now. But I'm just showing you what the Bible says. He says, but you denied <coughs> the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be, to be granted unto you. <clears throat> and you killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Now watch, he tells you how he did it. And his name, the name of Jesus, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. Stop right there. He just told you how he did it. Right? Now you can't argue with that. You can't say, well, but you understand it was this, it was that, it was that and, and it was because Peter was an apostle. And it, no, he just said it wasn't by our own, our own power or our own holiness, that we made this man to walk. He said it was the name of Jesus and faith in that name that made him walk. All right? <clears throat> now, the reason I say that, and the reason I want to bring this to you, actually yesterday and coming into today, is very simple. All Peter said he used was the name of Jesus, and it was faith in that name that allowed that name to do the work. All right? So if, now, what Peter said healed the lame man was the name of Jesus and faith in that name. Correct? Isn't that right? Now, how do you get saved? Isn't it faith in the name of Jesus? Right? Now, when you have faith in the name of Jesus, how do you, once you have faith in the name of Jesus, you're saved. Then he said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Isn't that right? So he gives you the right to use that name. Right? So you have faith in the name, and now you have the right to use that name. Right? 
So you can say you have the name and you have faith in the name. Isn't that right? So is there any difference between you and Peter that made this lame man walk? Did Peter say he had anything that, that he used that you don't have? So, I mean, if we stopped right now, you would have what you need to get the job done. You understand? Now, <clears throat> you still may have to figure out how to use it and how to make it work, but you would be certain of this. You have what you need. Right? Don't need anything else. Don't need anything added. You know, don't need a gift. Don't need a, you know, an anointing. Uh, don't need a word. Peter didn't have a word. Right? He, did, he didn't say, and God spoke to Peter and said, look over there at that lame man. You know, and, and go over there and heal him. He didn't see this. See, these are all the things that we have built up in the church. And we read it in. And, and the reason is, you'll find out that all of our reasoning are all excuses that give us a reason or an excuse not to do what the Bible says. Every one of them. Well, you know, you got to be led by the Spirit. Okay, well, okay, where does it say that exactly? Led by the Spirit to do something. Before you can do the Bible, you have to be led by the Spirit to do that. Because everybody says, well, uh, you know, you, well, you just got to be led by the Spirit. Okay, give me a verse. You see? That's what everybody says. And then they go, oh, well, uh, Romans eight fourteen. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. Okay, what does that got to do with healing the sick? You see, we pull that verse out. Remember, context is everything. Go back and read Romans 8. Romans 8, 14 is right in the middle of Romans 8. And the whole chapter is only talking about one thing. And it says, here's how you can know that you are truly born of God. If you are really born of God, then the Spirit will lead you to mortify the deeds of the flesh. It has nothing to do with healing the sick. It said, <clears throat> He will lead you to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Because... He says, here's how you know that you're being led by the Spirit, and you'll know it's the Spirit of God that's leading you, because the Spirit of the flesh is not going to lead you to kill the deeds of the flesh. Right? And whenever you're being led to mortify the deeds of the flesh, you know you're being led by the Spirit of God, because that's the only Spirit that's going to lead you to mortify the deeds of the flesh. And that's, that's what all of Romans 8 is talking about. You cannot pull one verse out and try to make it apply to everything else that it is not referring to. Okay? Now... Matter of fact, Jesus said that um, when he talked about the Spirit, he said, and when the Spirit of truth has come, right? He said, it's good for you that I go, because if I don't go, then I can't send the Spirit back to you. He said, but when the Spirit of truth is come, and notice it does not say he will lead you to heal the sick or do anything else. It says, he will lead and guide you into all truth. The Spirit's job is to lead you to truth. Now, once he leads you to truth, as a matter of fact, if you read what it says, it says he will convict the world of sin, he will convict the world of righteousness and all this stuff. But all of that is working on people's hearts. Okay? Every bit of it. And it says he will lead you to the truth. He will show you the truth. It says he will tell you everything I've said, and he will reveal to you everything, and he'll bring to your remembrance everything I've said. Right? But it's a, that's part of his leading you to truth. That's not him leading you on a second-by-second -second basis. To go do something. Now, he leads you to truth. Once, he, once you find the truth, now, once you get the truth, once you understand it, once he has led you to that truth, then it is your responsibility to make the decision to walk in the truth. Here's what people do. They will say, well, it's the Spirit's responsibility to lead me to pray for who God wants me to pray for. So, okay, Holy Spirit, you lead me. Which one should I pray for? Okay, Jesus made it very plain. He said, heal these sick that are therein in the city. Remember Luke 10? I just read that to you yesterday. So, is there any differentiation about who to pray for, who not to pray for? Or is it all the sick? So, you don't need a leading about which one to go to. You just need to take the time to go to all of them. You understand? There, you cannot find anywhere in the New Testament where the Spirit of God ever led any person to heal the sick or do anything like that. As a matter of fact, let me be very specific. <clears throat> we, okay, if we are to be led totally by the Spirit and only do what the Spirit says, then we don't need a Bible at all. We don't need it. You know, once you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, come to Christ, you don't need a Bible. You just throw it away. You don't need it anymore. 
Well, why do we need it? Well, because the Spirit's going to lead you what to do. So if I'm going to be led by the Spirit, then I don't need it. Well, yeah, but we've got to read the Bible so we'll know what to do. What? Wait a minute, make up your mind. Can the Spirit ever lead you not to pray for the sick? No, because he's already said, heal the sick that are therein. So the Spirit can't lead you to do what he's already told you to do. Right? So this is our problem. Now, in Romans 8, 14... You go back into the Greek and it actually says this. As many as are constantly led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Now see, people say, oh, you don't believe in being led by the Spirit. No, I do. I believe, I believe it more than you do. Because you believe that God's going to lead you at certain times, at special times, by special leadings. Right now, get up and go do this. Does God do that? Yes, he did it with Paul. He's done it with different people throughout the Bible. So yes, I believe in special leadings. I believe there are certain times when God may wake you up in the middle of the night and go, you know, go down to Kmart, go to aisle three, there's a person there standing there with a blue shirt. Talk to them, right? Now, if that happens, I guarantee you that wasn't God's plan. What it was is God was watching the guy with the blue shirt and he watched about five or six Christians walk past him and he told them, witness to this guy. And none of them were listening. Right? So then he had to find son. So then his search widens. And he starts talking to Christians in a bigger circle. And finally one of them goes, what? Okay, yeah, I'll go. And they go. And then they talk about it later on, about how God sent them to aisle four and think, oh, you're spiritual. You've been. No. God had to expand his search because God's plan was, first Christian who walked past there should have looked at that guy and said, you need to get saved. And that's what should have happened. Right? But our problem is, and, and it all comes out of fear because we just don't want to do the Bible. So we ask God, I, well, I ain't got time to go around healing everybody. So God, you point out which one you want me to go to. And where we get that from is, well, yeah, but I went out and prayed for people and they didn't get healed. Really, how do you know? Well, I didn't see anything. Oh, okay, well then, <laughs> you, shouldn't have done, you shouldn't have been out there anyway. Don't even call yourself a Christian because the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. So, now, did you lay hands on them? Yeah. Then you were obedient. Right? Yeah, but I didn't see any results, okay? When you were disobedient and didn't lay hands on anybody, did you see results then? Well, of course not. Well, which is better? Being obedient without results or being disobedient without results? Right? It'd be better to be obedient, right? And if you're obedient and you walk in the Word and you do what you're supposed to do, you will get results. Because when you do what's right and you do it the right way, you get results. Right? See, it's, it's like the old saying, well, it's not... Whether you win or lose, but how you play the game? Well, if you play the game right, you win. Right? Real simple. And so, what you have to realize is that the Spirit of God... Okay, here, let me give you the reason why. There are special leadings, but then the normal leading is you've read the Bible, you agree with the Bible, and then wherever you see a chance to apply Scripture of the Bible into a real-life situation, you do it. Right? When you do that, then you are becoming the Word personified. Right? Or as we would say in the Bible, the Word made flesh. Because as you... Matter of fact, the Bible even says that. In, what, back in Hebrews, it says that by these precious promises... Or uh, Peter, Peter too. It says by these precious promises, we become partakers of the divine nature. So as you take these precious promises and you start to incorporate them into your life, God's nature is worked into your life. Why? Because every one of these promises in here is part of God's nature. See, you want to be led by the Spirit. The Bible doesn't tell you that. What you should be led by is God's nature and His character. And if you be led by God's nature and character, you will do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Very, it's very simple. Now, <clears throat> you have to... Several times, well, actually, uh, what, Matthew, I think, 4, 4, somewhere around there, it talks about Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Right? Why didn't anybody ever claim that one? You know, you want, you want to be led by the Spirit? There's a clear example where the Spirit led him out to be tempted. Well, I'll tell you why you don't claim it. You don't need the devil. You don't need the Spirit to lead you out to be tempted. You can find the devil on your own. Right? So you don't need to do that. Now, that was a specific case for Jesus for what he had to go through. That's not you. Matter of fact, he even said, pray this prayer. Lead us not into temptation. Right? So if you pray that prayer, then you've got to believe that God answers that prayer. So when anytime you're being led into temptation, you know it's not God. 
right? You just got to believe your own prayers. Now, he said, he will lead and guide you into all truth. Now, there is no virtue. Think about this. There is no virtue in an automobile, right? It sits there until you do what you need to do to get it somewhere. You start it up, put it in drive, you steer it, right? It is totally neutral in where it goes. What it, it doesn't care. It only goes where you lead it to go. You can pull into church or you can pull into a bar, right? The car didn't take you to church in the sense that it took you there and said, here, get out, you're going to church. It didn't take you to the bar. You took it to the bar, right? So the, the virtue or the non-virtue is not in the vehicle, <clears throat> it's in the person in it, right? Now, if you are to be so <clears throat> led by the Spirit to where you don't even have any will. You know, you just do whatever. Well, well, I'm walking through Kmart and the sick person comes by and if God wants me to pray for him, I guess he'll just take my hand and throw it over on him and I'll know, okay, I'm supposed to pray for you. Okay? And you see how silly that sounds? But really, that's... You take the logical conclusion of what people believe and that's what most people want. Because in the world, you know, if I do that, I know it'll work. So what you're telling me is you only want to... If you only go to bat when you know you're going to make a home run, you'd never go to the plate. Right? You've got to get out there and swing. And you do your best every time. Now, you can... The virtue is in you choosing. See, the Spirit leads you to truth. Healing is the truth. All right? The gospel is the truth. Salvation is the truth. Baptism in the Spirit is the truth. These are truth. Holiness is the truth. The Spirit leads you to that truth. Now, virtue comes whenever you, by an act of your free will, decides to walk in that truth. If it's just the Spirit leading you like a puppet, then no matter what you did, even if you were perfectly obedient to the Spirit, there'd be no virtue in it because it's just the Spirit moving you around. So for there to be virtue, for you to have any type of reward or any type of, of uh, reward coming from God because of how you live your life, then it's going to be because you choose to obey the Word of God. You understand? Not because you're led like some puppet. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read that to you a little bit later on, something that John Lake said about that very thing. But that's what most people want. The reason they want it is because they want to abdicate their position of responsibility, and they want to put it back on God so that they can stand before God someday and hope they can say, God, you didn't move me to pray for the sick. I would have had a lot more healings. I would have had a lot more more trophies to present to you if you had moved me, but you never moved me. You never led me by your spirit to do that. So again, it goes back to you're going to point the finger at God and say, the reason they didn't get healed is because you didn't lead me. And he, see, most people are waiting on a phone call from God when he's already sent you a letter. <laughs> see, that's your problem. That's what you're waiting for. And at some point, you just have to believe what is written. See, the, the greatest faith or, or the most faith that you can use, and we're going to talk more about faith today because I want to explain because I know, you know, I'm, I'm using, for lack of better words, <clears throat> things that if you listened yesterday, you go, wait a minute, I thought you said this yesterday, so I want, to, I want to clarify. But God considers faith when you can take a general command and apply it to a specific situation. Right? So any, situa any situation you see out there, if you, if you can take a scripture and apply it to that situation and fix that situation, when you do that, that's faith. Right? That's faith in God that he's going to keep his word. Right? It's that simple. Now, <clears throat> let, me, um, let me go back to Mark chapter 16 real quick and then I will send you to break. Mark 16, I will show you, remember I told you I was going to show you how literal I believe the Bible? Okay. And I'll show you why. Now, if you have, well, definitely in the King James, but in a lot of other translations also, if there are words in italics, it means it's not in the original Greek. Right? Okay. So, anytime you're reading through your Bible, if you see words in italics, it means that the translators put that word in there to try, to try to help you understand what they thought it meant. 
Yeah, it's in the King James. Now, other Bibles have it too. Other translations have it, but not all of them have it. So, and, and again, I'm not saying the King James is you know, the best translation because there's definitely words in there that could have been translated better. But it is the most widely used and still kind of the standard. It's what I grew up reading, so I understand it pretty easy. But if you read, the best way to find out what is actually there is go back into the original Greek and read what was there. Okay, and you say, well, I don't read Greek. Well, there's plenty of things out there to help you not necessarily read Greek, but give you the English translation. It just depends on how bad you want to know. And so, whenever, before I could go to Dr. Summerall's Bible school, actually, I never ended up going through his Bible school. I ended up spending time with him. Thought I was going to his Bible school. And before I could go there, I found what books they used to teach Greek and ordered the books because I knew it would take me a while to get there. And so I basically taught myself up to the second year Greek student before I got there. And that way I knew that I could kind of jump into class wherever I needed to. And then I ended up not going to the Bible school. So, you know, apparently God used that for a reason. So I don't, uh, I don't claim to be able to read and write and translate and that kind of stuff accurately enough for me to do it on my own. But I can go back into it and see if someone says it says this, I can look and say, no, it doesn't say that. I, I know because of this, because of that, and these things. So. But whether you can read Greek or not, doesn't matter today because there's so many good tools out there that you don't need to. Matter of fact, uh, by far the best New Testament translation from the original Greek was written by Kenneth S. Wiest. It is the most accurate translation out there. Okay? It's that simple. It's called uh, an expanded translation of the New Testament. And he actually did a four-volume work, but the last volume is the New Testament by itself, or you can get the New Testament by itself in paperback. And they're like 25 bucks, something like that. But it is, um, all Greek scholars agree, he was the Greek professor at Moody Bible Institute. And whenever he did his Greek translation New Testament, you really can't see any of his denominational leanings. But when you read his commentaries, you can see it. So... It was amazing how he was not able to not do that. And whenever you read his New Testament, what you're reading is exactly what a first century Greek person would understand the original Greek to say. Right? So once you get back to the original Greek, all the differences just kind of disappear. Right? So uh, I highly recommend that, that translation. Anyway, in Mark 16, now you know all of 15 through 18. We've read that before. But down in verse 19 it says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they, talking about the apostles, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And then it says, Amen. See, most people say, Amen means the end. It doesn't mean the end. It means, so be it. Okay? Okay. So in other words, what he's saying is, as that what was happening there, it should continue to so be. Right? Now, notice verse 20. They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with. Now notice that word them is not in the Greek. Right? It doesn't say that. The Lord working, and the way it actually reads in the Greek is this. The Lord working with and confirming the word. He was not confirming apostles. He was not confirming people. He was confirming the word they preached. Okay? That's why literally anybody can preach gospel. And if their message is accurate, even if they're not born again, people will get saved, healed, and delivered based on the word that's preached. But it'll be because the people believe the word or God confirms the word even though he's not confirming the person that's preaching it. Because that's why unsaved people can preach the gospel and things happen. Right? That's why it's, it's best not to put people on pedestals. All right? The, the thing, if, matter of fact, we're going to read this in a few minutes. Paul said, what does it matter? Well, you know, why do you say I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos? He says, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers of God. In other words, he said, it's not me you're following if I'm preaching the gospel. It's God. It's not Apollos. So why do you pick and choose, well, I'm this person. He says, as long as you're picking between people, you're still carnal and not spiritual. So the idea is not, see, people say, well, well, again, different things. Well, you know, which preacher, what preacher here, you know, that's irrelevant. 
What counts is the message they're preaching. Right? Now, there are some people that it is hard for me to listen to. Just the sound of their voice. Right? Just, I, it's just hard. Right? But if their message is accurate, then I will, listen, I will suffer through the voice to hear the message. Because it's the message. See, it's not about me liking the sound of their voice. It's that message that's going to give me what I need when I have a problem. Right? And I can suffer through the sound of a voice. You know, when I was in the military, I didn't like the sound of my drill instructor's voice. All right? Especially when he was yelling and cussing at me. Okay? Didn't like it. But I knew en well enough to listen to him. Right? And matter of fact, I thought if I listen to him well enough, maybe he'll stop yelling. Okay? I was wrong. He didn't. But still, it's, you know. <clears throat> so, but the Bible says that the word of, or that, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The word salvation means healing, deliverance, prosperity. It means all of that, right? So the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is the power of God. So quit trying to think of how to get power. Till Osborne says it this way. Most people are trying to get more power when really all they need is more gospel. Right? So quit trying to be powerful in yourself. We talked about authority yesterday. We're going to do it again today because that's a key. Because first off, everybody's trying to get some authority. And you even hear things like, well, okay, well, take authority. Well, that's, that's, that's a good way to say it. Because you take responsibility. Authority comes with responsibility. If you have children, the reason you have authority over your children is because you take responsibility for your children. When you quit taking responsibility, the state will take away your authority. All right? So if you want authority, you want authority over sickness and disease, it's real easy. Take responsibility for the people that have the sickness and disease and become your brother's keeper. And you go out and you help them. And as you take responsibility for their wellness, then the authority is automatically there to set them free. Right? So quit trying to go for authority. And Now, now understand this. I say that. And here's the, here's the thing. As a... You know, again, send you to break here in just a second. I, I, my dad's been a policeman pretty much all my life that I can remember. Uh, I've been in law enforcement. I'm a correctional officer in the military. I've been around law enforcement. I've been around policemen, different levels. Uh, when I was teaching martial arts, I taught FBI agents. I taught police departments and different things. So I've always been around that. I, and I was raised up in that. Now, so I have a respect for law enforcement, especially for what they go through. And I, I've seen it from the inside, okay? But they are human. Now, the amazing thing is, and this is what I was talking to my dad about one time that a policeman, <clears throat> my, my dad's name is Johnny Blake, so I'm going to use him as an example. Johnny Blake, and, and the name Johnny Blake doesn't mean a thing. You understand? If, if my dad got out in the middle of a street in plain clothes, put his hand up, more, people, people are not uh, obliged to stop. But if he got out there in a uniform, they'll stop. Why? Not because they recognize Johnny Blake, but because they recognize the uniform. They recognize the badge. You understand? If they don't recognize the badge, they recognize the gun. Okay? So, now, the badge is the authority. Johnny Blake doesn't have authority. Uh, see, you understand what I'm saying? A policeman, the man, doesn't have authority. When a policeman, if he arrests you, or even gives you a ticket... He only signs his name or his badge number so that they know who to contact to send to court to testify against you. But what it will say is the state or the city or whatever you know, government authority he represents, it will say that state or that city versus that person. Right? So it doesn't say Johnny Blake versus so-and-so. You understand? Because it's not Johnny Blake that is doing it. Johnny Blake represents the state. Johnny Blake has no authority. The state has authority. The authority that Johnny Blake is operating in is not his. It is the state's authority. You understand? But he represents the state, but even then, technically, he doesn't have authority. It's the state's authority he's executing. And he executes the full authority of the state. Which means that <clears throat> if he pulls a car over and then that car wants, or the person in that car 
wants to fight with him or disobey him, then Johnny Blake, representing the state or the city, has a radio to call for backup. And if they hear something along the lines of need backup or officer down or something like that, I can guarantee you, without being told, every law enforcement, whether they work for the same city or the state or anybody else, everyone in the area that can get there will get there. Why? Because they're all coming in because this officer needs help. Now, you know, not getting into all the other aspects of it, but the reason I bring that up is because I want you to understand. He is one man. As a human, he makes mistakes. Right? But, in the fulfillment of his office, the entire state backs him up and the full force of the state backs him up. And if he chased a person into a house, then the state will bring in SWAT. They'll bring in as much power as they need to get the job done. You understand? Why? But not because they're backing up Johnny Blake, but they're backing up their representative who represents the full authority of the state. You understand? That's who you are. As a Christian, as a believer, you are God's policeman. And the kingdom of heaven totally backs you up. Now, this is the amazing thing to me. when we're, I was talking about, I said, Dad, what if, let's say a policeman makes a really bad mistake. Let's say he does, he just, you know, messes up. He, he arrests this person. It's not the right person. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's just totally messed up. You know? And my dad said, well, he said, it, it would depend on this. Did he, was, was the policeman operating on what they call good faith? I thought, good faith? I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, if that policeman can show without, you know, without any shadow of doubt or, 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 with, or beyond any reasonable doubt, put it that way, that he believed that this was the guy he was looking for and that he believed that this guy had done that, then when he arrested him, when that guy proves that he wasn't that guy and that guy wants to, to sue somebody, the guy cannot sue the policeman. He sues the state. That's how invisible the individual is. You understand? People say, but what if, I, what if I go out there and pray for somebody and do the wrong thing? What if you do? It doesn't come back on you. It comes back on the kingdom of God. Let them deal with it. You, you've got a, an advocate that will go to court over you and say, no, he, he's innocent. Don't worry about that. He was operating in good faith. Do you understand? This is so simple. Once you understand that this goes back not to religiosity, but to governmental authority, on his shoulders shall be the government. When you get a hold of that and you realize two kingdoms are at war, and our kingdom, the kingdom of God's dear son, has defeated the kingdom of darkness. And our job is to find... Now, you have to understand. See, and I'm trying to stop here. I really am. <clears throat> People say, but I, I gave the devil authority when I did this. Okay, first off, a criminal can never have authority. You understand? He cannot have authority. Now, matter of fact... You can't even give him authority. Okay, the devil was a, was a liar and a murderer from the beginning, right? Before Adam and Eve, <clears throat> Satan tried to overthrow heaven. He was kicked out. <clears throat> now, based on that, that means that before he tried, or before he fooled and uh, deceived uh, Eve, and, and before all that happened, he was already a criminal, Right? There was already, as we would say, an arrest warrant for him, okay? And that's why God told Adam, you keep the earth, subdue it, make it obey you, guard it, right? Guard this garden. In other words, don't let any thieves or robbers come in. Well, one did. And he said, and, and here's, here's the thing about it. Since he was already a wanted criminal, then you can't give him authority, See, if a bank robber robs a bank and then turns around and gives the money to somebody to pay off their car, 
Okay, that doesn't make the bank robber right. You understand? You can't make him right until he is paid for what he did. Right? And until he's paid, then he is still a criminal, a renegade, an outlaw against God. You understand? I'm talking about the devil now. So, when you say, yeah, but I gave the devil authority. Okay, first off, if you are in Christ, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Isn't that right? So you're not your own. Now, if you're not your own, how can you give the devil authority over you? you? See, I own that Tahoe out there. If you find the keys laying around up here, and then you go out and get in it and drive, just because you find the keys, or let's say I leave the key in the ignition and the door is unlocked. Just because you find it like that, if you drive off in it, you still stole it. Right? And you're still wrong. Now, I was stupid, but you're wrong. Right? So, because you don't have authority to drive that vehicle, you understand? Because it's not yours. Now, if I didn't own it, I couldn't even give you authority to drive it. Right? So, what makes you think that you can give the devil authority if you're not your own? Jesus would have to give the devil authority. Right? You say, well then, he must have given the devil authority because I'm sick. Since when does a robber need permission? If a robber has permission, he's not a robber. Right? Being a thief means you didn't have permission to take the thing. See, this stuff is real simple once you get it out of, you know, religiosity. And you come to, and that's why, that's why the, the non-religious people understood Jesus. The religious people didn't get it. That's why religious people have a hard time with the gospel that I preach. Why? Because it's the same one Jesus preached. It's the same one Paul preached. But religious people have a hard time. But people on the street go, I get it. I see that. That's why I love military, law enforcement. People are like, come on, they get it. It's real simple. There's commands to be obeyed. Let's do it. We don't stop until we get another command. Right? And we don't have one yet. So we just keep on doing it. And, and anything that stops you, now, now listen carefully, anything that, that stands between you and the fulfillment of a promise in the Bible is a devil. You understand? It's not God. God is not going to stand between you and a promise and keep you from fulfilling His Word. So anything that stands between you and the fulfillment of a clear promise of the Word of God is a devil. And that includes anybody that tells you not to keep his word. Right? Jesus said, if you do my words, you'll be great in the kingdom of heaven. Actually, he said, if you do them and teach them. He said, but if you teach any person to break the least commandment, then you will be least in the kingdom of God. Isn't that simple? So the last thing we want to do is tell people, no, don't lay hands on the sick. No, don't go, don't go witnessing. No, you're not ready yet. Don't, no, don't... Hit. Why? Because the field is, is ready. Well, yeah, but, but, but the workers, they're not ready yet. How ready you got to be to say, hey, you need Jesus. Let me help you. You see? All right, take a break. Get up, get moving, or I'll keep talking.